So, well, my name is Federico. I'm actually um, from a town not far from here. So it's, it's a town near Modena. And uh, it's very nice to have AeroPython so close to my hometown this year. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm here to talk about a project I did um, with a startup in London. And uh, it's one of the first projects I did uh, that was um, uh, very data focused. Um, so essentially, like I'm, I'm here to talk about like some of the experience um, I had uh, with data in the last seven eight months, and um, yeah, some of the tools I used and some of the choices um, that we made, uh, both in terms of like architecting the system and in terms of like using the tools. Um, so the talk is about is about uh, Redshift, uh, which is a database, and um, Airflow, which is uh, like a framework to uh, which I'm going to explain later. Um, so my background is is actually kind of web development, and and I also done like a lot of DevOps in the past. Uh, I've used mostly Django. Um, I've done another presentation at AeroPython three years ago, and it was all about Ansible, uh, which is a tool like I really uh, I really enjoy, and and I encourage you to to have a look at it because it's quite nice. Um, but then like data pipelines arrived and then I had to uh, like we had to choose like a different stack. It was it was a project where like a lot of a lot of data processing was happening. Um, there was no web component and um, essentially we, we decided to uh, choose a different stack. Um, we use uh, Airflow which is um, uh, a project that was uh, kind of born uh, within Airbnb, but then it got incubated by Apache, and now it's like an Apache project. Um, and then we use like, some proprietary tools like uh, Amazon Redshift, which is like the kind of the big one, um, and also S3, which is uh, uh, like a, like a s essentially like an, an infinite hard drive. It's like an object storage, and it's very well known. Um, so we started from like obviously we started from a product problem about like and and the product problem was about uh tracking actually like the attendance of uh conferences around the world like and we were focusing on technology uh so we wanted to understand who was going to what conferences in order to uh, like present this data and attract sponsors like for conferences um, and so it was like quite an interesting project, uh, but then really like the technical question that we wanted to answer was how do we query and cross-reference like multiple external data sources? Because most of the data that we were working uh, with uh, was not managed by us, uh, it was external. Um, so we, we kind of needed to um, bring the data in our control. Um, there was a lot of uh, a lot of integration, so it was multiple external data points, and we just wanted the freedom to query and cross-reference all these all these data sets. And uh, really, the answer to this question is is actually, in principle, it's quite simple. Like you just have to download all the data feeds, um, so you can you you have access to the kind of raw data, um, so you can do any sort of operation when you have the raw data. A plus, like you need to load them in a system which allows you to query the data in the way you want. Um, this system can be can be anything, can be Excel, can be PostgreSQL, uh, but we decided to use Redshift because um, kind of our use case, um, the kind of the type of queries that we wanted to run um, were like like a good use case for Redshift. Um, so yeah, I mean, essentially those are the two things that you have to do, but um, <coughs> depending on the complexity of the project, uh, sometimes uh, there are multiple downloaders, there are multiple databases. Um, so essentially, like you need to make sure you build a good system to manage, uh, to manage data. And, and here we talk about data pipelines, um, which, is a, which is a generic term and it just indicates like the the system that kind of supervises all the downloading and all the loading in the, in the database um, and all the kind of transformation that you do on the data. 
um, and we work on these um, uh, pipelines like kind of following like some principles, uh, like three or four, prin three principles. Um, first of all, um, we needed a system that was able to scale to any number of inputs. Uh, we needed a system that was generic enough to uh, be easily adaptable to any sort of feed, any sort of data coming in with any sort of mechanism. And um, you can think of it as a, as a mixer. So like essentially you have a lot of inputs and, and then you just mix and match in the way you want it. Um, this is opposite to, for example, like a web app where there's uh, like a, a, a plurality of outputs, like a different output for different users. But here, like, it's kind of reversed. So you have many inputs, and you have like one output, which is kind of the database, uh, that in the structure that you want in the database. Um, so it's very important, like, for data pipelines to do all the processing in stages, um, because you know you might actually have like quite a complex um, set of transformation transformations. Um, so if you think in, term of, in terms of stages, um, it becomes very easy to um, kind of state what sort of input you have and what sort of output uh, you expect the stage to produce. Um, and you just build your pipeline um, in a way that each, each stage does a particular thing, a particular type of process. And then if you do it that way, you, you know, you get you know, you get hopefully reusability of stages. You get um, you can separate uh, development stages like between different teams um, and so on. And uh, another um, thing, another principle um, that we use is that we should um, uh, archive everything, especially the inputs of the system, uh, because storage is cheap. Like you know, you can store a lot of data on S3 and, and you don't pay that much. Um, so it was very helpful to, for us to have like an historical record um, of, of everything that that, uh, that uh, was going in the system. And uh, the other purpose of it is that sometimes you, you have bugs in your code um, and for data pipelines you want the ability to kind of rerun your code on data that was uh, I don't know, like a month old or two months old because you realize you have the bug that we're talking about has been in production for like two months. And then you want to, uh, you discover the bug and you want to, you want the ability to go back and fix the output. And this is something that you can only do like with data pipelines. You can't really fix an HTTP 500 like in your kind of web application, but you can do this with data. So it's quite convenient that, that you, you have that. Uh, Possibility. Um, okay, so the tool, uh, the tool we use is uh, is a tool called Airflow. Uh, it's uh, it's a project that uh, is has been incubated recently in the Apache Software Foundation. Um, it's a batch processing framework, um, uh, opposed to like a streaming framework, uh, like Storm. I know yesterday there was a talk about Storm, um, but here we talk about um, batches. Um, and essentially, the big difference is that, um, like f f with a streaming architecture, everything is every transformation is scheduled at the start, and then data goes like real time through the stages. Um, but with a batch processing uh, framework, it's different because each step is only scheduled when it, when it's actually needed. Um, uh, so yeah, it's kind of a different architecture. Like in, in my eyes, it's a bit simpler, uh, and it's, it's also like the probably the oldest type of architecture, um, and more sound. Um, Airflow is a big community. There's um, a lot of stars on GitHub, and a lot of companies using it. Um, but yeah, I mean, really, Airflow like allows you to, to kind of build this sort of network of. Um, interconnected uh, tasks that you run. And you can be like very complex network. Um, you can have things run in parallel, things run sequentially. I mean, this example here, yeah, you, uh, which is some, like an example I found on the internet. Um, you essentially, you get approval files and then you start three parallel scrapers um, 
that are scraping uh, different things. But then at the end of every scraper, um, there's an update um, which is specific to the scraper. And uh, with Airflow, you can build these sort of networks uh, of any complexity, like um, some, some quite complex, some, some a bit simpler. And uh, it's Python all the way down. Uh, so like you, it's written in Python and, um, and you, you use it with Python. But then you, you will say like, why not using cron? I mean, cron has been around for ages. Uh, the problem with cron is that it's very simple. And uh, for our use case, it was too simple. Like there's no way to define dependencies between jobs uh, as in like only start job B if job A has been successful. Uh, you can't do that. Um, there's no retry mechanism, and there's very, very simple error reporting. Um, so it was it was too simple for us. Uh, so obviously we decided to use Air Airflow. Um, so the way you install it is very simple. You just pip install Airflow uh, as it's written in Python. You initialize a database, um, which is. Um, so Airflow is a very stateful application. Essentially, it tracks uh, execution of every everything that you kind of put in the system, and and all this information is written in the database. So yeah, you need it just needs a database, and then you start a web server, and then you have something like that. So this is a UI of 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 a system kind of we have in production, and essentially it just lists all the workflows that you have. Uh, Workflows is a term uh, that is roughly like a cron job. Um, so every every workflow has a name, as a, as an owner, and as like the schedule. If it's daily, if it's hourly, if it's you know you can define. You can be very flexible in defining when something needs to run. Um, uh, yeah, I mean it's it's actually quite simple, and, and the UI is quite powerful. There's a lot of things you can do with the UI. Um, but I wanted to show you like how do you actually use Airflow. So Airflow, uh, as I mentioned before, is written in Python, and um, you essentially create these files called DAGs. Um, DAG is, a, is an Airflow term, which essentially is um, workflow, means workflow. Um, you create, uh, like you, inst uh, you create a file you, with Python code in it, uh, which essentially instantiates uh, a DAG class um, which declares um, kind of the workflow name uh, and then you pass a few parameters to kind of the one of the most important one is the, the schedule interval whether you want it daily when you want it hourly and so on and then you, you start to compose your workflow uh, by creating uh, tasks which are instances of operators um, the operator is is the thing that uh, kind of tells Airflow how to run this step. And um, yeah, I can more on that in the next slide. So essentially we run um, two commands, two bash commands in this case. Um, one is to um, uh, generate a report because the workflow is about uh, kind of generating reports for the business team. It's just like, a, like an example uh, use case. Um, so the first step would be to generate a report, and the last step would be to email the report um, uh, kind of to the business team. Um, the second task needs to always happen at the end of the first task, and only if the first task, task succeeded. Um, so essentially, that's the way you do it. You, you just declare a DAG, you declare the two steps, and then at the end, you just say, like, T2, set upstream T1, which means that uh, T2 is always executed after T1. Uh, yeah, essentially you have the kind of this very simple DAG. You put the, the DAG in the DAGs folder of Airflow, and then it just gets picked up automatically. And, and, and I mean, for this DAG, it will be executed hourly. And then the, at the end of every hour, you have an execution. Um, uh, for like this different types of operators, um, you can launch uh, bash commands, you can launch uh, kind of Python functions. Um, th that's an example there. Um, and this is like the, the two most common things, like 
that, that cannot be used in, in the project. Um, but I know you can, uh, you can use like Docker, this Docker operator that you can use to launch uh, Docker containers. Um, and there's also something called sensors, which uh, essentially is um, a specific, like a special type of operator that is waiting for an event to happen, uh, which might be like a um, file uploaded to S3 um, or any other sort of thing that you need to wait for. Um, everything is uh, templated in Jinja, um, so you can have, um, for example, like kind of Python files with, you know, essentially variables there that can be substituted on the fly by Airflow, um, or the same for, for bash scripts. Uh, I mean, this is like quite helpful, for example, if you want to pass uh, uh, variables from, from Airflow itself to your scripts. Uh, or alternatively, you can use like, uh, you can pass as arguments to Python functions, um, like, like the example here. Um, So I, I want to kind of uh, delve a bit deeper into like how actually Airflow works internally. Um, so everything, as I said before, is visible through the UI. Um, so you have uh, essentially um, you can see every execution of, of things uh, in the past and the result of it. Um, so for example, if you have um, a workflow that runs daily, you will have in the UI uh, the possibility to see all the all the statuses, all the results of uh, every execution of the script, um, going back uh, from today to to the date that the script started running, and uh, yeah, you can zoom in and uh, you can see, for example, for every for every task, uh, there is there is a task instance which is like a database construct which essentially stores the start time, stores the end time, the duration and uh, the state, um, uh, whether it's been successful or not. Uh, yeah, it's, it's very informative, especially if, if, if like kind of one of the main things the company does is, is data processing. Um, so how does Airflow like runs all your tasks? Um, so you can, you can choose like mainly two uh, types of scheduling. Uh, one is um, kind of scale up using like a pre fork model, like um, like what Apache, what Nginx, that what all the Unix daemon do. Essentially, they just have a parent process which forks like four or five child processes. And then uh, the parent process like pulls for new jobs. And when you have a new job, a new task, uh, the, the child process will execute the task and track the the result and write the result back in, in the kind of Airflow database. Um, this works very well for like one server. Uh, if you want, if you have the need to scale to multiple servers, you can use a kind of salary executor. Uh, but like this, it's definitely more complex. You need to have a message queue. You need to have a be more installed. Um, but you can definitely use it. Um, so regarding all this information that um, that the system is tracking, um, yeah, like essentially, like you have um, uh, like a lot of information and one which is the state. Um, so you want to you want to know when things are running. You want to know when things have finished running, and you want to know whether they they were successfully run or they were they failed and. Uh, if they failed, um, Airflow has, has this kind of mechanism of like retry. You can definitely specify like uh, how many times you want the dog to be retried, and uh, you can also be more granular than that, and you can specify like how many how many times do you want a specific task to be retried. And if there is a retry mechanism, there's a couple of states: one is retry and one is failed. Um, and retry is like this essentially means it failed one time, but like I'm going to retry in five minutes, like a delay that you can set. And um, yeah, uh, those are kind of the state machines, the states. Um, so another concept I want to like introduce is that, um, and it's, it's, a, it's something that um, kind of differentiates Airflow and Cron, for example. 
is uh, our airflow deals with time and specifically downtime. Um, so the default behavior is to backfill uh, when like um, uh, where runs were supposed to run but did not, um, which essentially means um, if you have a cron job or like a workflow that is meant to be run daily, but then your server stays offline for a week, when the server comes back online, uh, essentially Afro um, realizes that for the last seven days the, the job wasn't running. So we launch like seven copies of your script. Um, and the difference between all these executions is that um, essentially there's a variable uh, passed uh, to, you, to the workflow called execution date. And uh, this variable will contain the date of like seven days ago, six, five, four, three, two, one days ago. Um, and this variable is meant to be used from your scripts to, to limit the, the amount of data that you process. Uh, I mean, this is like, like a very good behavior for, for example, like kind of report generation, like for the business team, because the business team doesn't care whether the server is up or not. It just wants to receive a report every day. Um, but it's actually quite bad uh, for scrapers. Um, we are running uh, like a lot of scrapers, and um, we don't want to run like you know seven scrapers at the same time. We just like first of all, it just kills our server, it kills their server, and uh, and we don't get any. We get exactly the same data. Um, so we started using uh, an operator which actually was re released uh, in the in the la latest version of Airflow, I think. Um, it's called latest run only operator and, and essentially skips all the past runs. It only runs the like the latest uh, the latest copy. Okay, so uh, yeah, that that was about Airflow. But like, essentially, the way we use Airflow is to to uh, to do like extract, load, transform, um, and more specifically. Uh, because of the tools we picked, uh, we have like a bit more of a general structure, like a specific generic structure. Um, so we started uh, generating batch IDs um, because we want to track um, every run of our, like our code, um, and we want to see what a, a specific execution, what, what sort of data a specific execution is generating and, and putting redshift. So we generate a batch ID, we create an initial folder structure, we run like kind of downloaders and a structure like, you know, whatever we want to run. Um, this is normally the step that takes the longest. Um, and then whatever comes out of that, we compress it, we upload it on three and, and we load it in redshift. Um, that's that's essentially like the generic steps that we, we used to follow. Um, so I mentioned batch IDs, um, and, and for us it was like, I mean, generally it's quite important to, to generate a batch ID because you want to track, um, uh, essentially, um, you want to be able to map back the data that you generated to the specific run. Um, for debugging purposes, or like if you want to fix a bug and, and go back and fix the data that this bug broke, like you need to, you know, you need to know what batch IDs were involved, and so you can remove the old the batch IDs and you can regenerate the data. Um, another reason to have batch IDs is that Airflow may rerun some of the steps, including loading a redshift. Um, so it's very important to have. Uh, to make this operation is important, so it doesn't matter how many times you you do it, um, the result will be always like once one and only one load in the table. Uh, so we timestamp all the data uh, again, very useful for like debugging. Uh, you want to know what time it was downloaded. You want to know what time it was written in S3. Um, yeah, and so on. Um, So, um, so we did uh, all this operation. We got to, you know, kind of run our, our downloaders. We got to, uh, like, we got some data on the hard drive. We have, we compressed it. We sent it to S3. 
but then like because we want to use Redshift, uh, it's quite important that we pick the formats that Redshift supports. Um, so there's two family of um, um, uh, of formats in Redshift. One is like column based, um, and the other one is row based. Um, I'm not going to talk much about column based. Uh, first of all, like it's a bit less common uh, in in the Python world. Um, I know there's Parquet and there's ORC, I think. Uh, but the support in Python is, is, is not great. It's, it's, it's not as supported as row-based formats. And also, like the row-based formats are like, generally more, more common. Um, so row-based formats are essentially three. Uh, one is CSV. One is uh, the other one is JSON lines, which is, which is um, like a bunch of JSON objects separated by new lines. And the last one, and also like the most recent one, is um, a format called Avro, uh, which is like an Apache um, standardized format. Um, so CSV is very simple. Everyone knows what it is. Unfortunately, it, it's, it's order dependent, it's flat, and it's quite hard to extend unless you all you do is append data to the end of it, um, which is quite limiting. Um, and it was, it's also untyped, um, so yeah, it was um, a bit simple for us. Um, JSON lines, again, it's very simple. It's, everyone knows what JSON is. Um, it's easy to extend. Um, because you, can, you can just add like keys to the to the JSON object, and 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 it should like factoristic work. Um, it's a bit verbose uh, unless you, if you don't use compression. But like you can use compression, so we can remove that. Uh, it's schemaless. Uh, it doesn't enforce a key being there or a key being there of a specific type, which might or might not be a problem uh, for you. Um, so the last the last format is Avro. Uh, it's not so common. It's it's quite easy to extend. Um, I think with Avro there's uh, the schema, so you can enforce uh, keys being there. You can enforce some types. Uh, unfortunately, like it's a bit more ecosystem. Um, and in our project, we decided to use uh, JSON lines. Um, so it's very simple, and it was it was good enough for us. Uh, so we got to the point that we uh, kind of save all this data in in, uh, in Redshift, and then let's talk a bit about Redshift. Um, so Redshift is a, is a product uh, created by Amazon. It's not open source. Um, and essentially what they did is they forked PostgreSQL and they made it work for all up workloads, like analytical queries. Um, but they changed quite a lot. They changed the, the query plan and they changed the storage engine. And uh, essentially it's like, it's like buying a car and changing the engine. Uh, it, it's quite a big change. Um, and they made it uh, work well for huge volumes of data. It has very good, like, on the fly compression support. Um, but then it's like a columnar database. So, which means for the kind of things that you would expect, uh, like a row based database, to be fast, actually, a right shift is quite slow um, given the right volumes of data. And, and it's the opposite is also true for the things that. Um, you know, there's low on, on Postgres, they're quite fast on Redshift. Uh, for example, aggregate on, on single columns, having like many values in that column is actually quite fast for Redshift, but quite slow uh, on um, PostgreSQL, for example. Um, if you have, uh, if you do lots of like insert updates on single rows, um, it's definitely is lower than PostgreSQL. If you select a single row, and that row, you want all the columns, that's quite slow in Redshift. And it's, it's because like, the biggest difference is really like the storage model. Um, the Redshift is a column disk, uh, uses a column disk layout, and Postgres has, has uh, like a row disk layout. It really means like when, when you have a, a table, like um, the way Postgres writes in a, in a disk is like traversing each each column uh, row by row, like in a kind of a horizontal way. 
and uh, yeah, that's the result you get. But like with Redshift, the, the traversal is actually reversed, so it traverses all the values of a column, and then when you recess the end, it does the second column, the third column, and so on. Um, I mean, this is pretty fundamental, and that's, that's why performance is reversed. Um, and um, yeah, and that's, that's, yeah, that's, that's why, why queries that are slow, or in process they are fast in Redshift. Um, the other big difference is that the block size uh, is normally quite big, uh, so you can load a lot more data in memory at once, while with uh, PostgreSQL you have you have a different different like many different cycles for like many different um, loading steps, and I mean considering that the database, um, like the most critical part of a database is loading data from 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 an hard disk to to the memory. I mean this is is quite big. Um, Okay, so that was Redshift, and uh, but like how do we actually use it from um, from our system? And uh, so Redshift has very good support for S3, and if you have the files on S3 of a format that uh, Redshift supports, it's just a matter of like executing a SQL query. Uh, is a copy is a copy command. Uh, you specify the destination table. You specify where data should be read from, um, and you specify whether it's a JSON file or not. And in our case, it's a JSON, it's a JSON lines file, and the uh, GZIP is compressed. Um, and what this query does is like four things. One is uh, reading data from S3. Uh, once it's read, it, like, it decompresses data on the fly. And then it does something called like JSON path flattening. Um, which I'm going to explain in, in, in a second. Um, and then whatever comes out of this third operation is then appended to, to an existing table. Uh, so it's a loading, loading this data in the table. Um, so JSON path flattening is essentially um, an operation that takes a nested structure like JSON. Um, you know, with JSON you have like key values, but then a value can be another object, so you have like another set of key values, or can be an array, um, and essentially like you have a lot more nesting. Uh, but then if you think about Redshift, Redshift is still like a relational database. So you have tables, and tables are like a flat, flat structure. So like the way you, um, I mean the way we decided to do it is uh, using JSON and JSON path which essentially, um, when you apply this, uh, this file to a JSON lines object, it will generate like a sort of CSV with five fields. Uh, the first one being the value of, of, the, um, of the key ID. Uh, the second one being the first uh, element of the array of the value of data one. Uh, then you have like subfield of data two uh, and so on. Um, so at the end of this, you have a flat structure that you can just append to a table, and that's, that's the way we did it. Um, another thing worth mentioning is that, um, like you know, for 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 any software project, the, the schema of the database is quite important. Um, we wanted to have the schema uh, kind of versioned and storing it like you probably would with any other. Uh, infrastructure code. If you're using Ansible, you want Ansible to be to be in your repository. If you use Terraform, the same thing. And and uh, the schema is just another is another one of those assets that you really should put in Git and, and version. Uh, so yeah, we definitely use SQL Alchemy. Uh, we don't rely on SQL Alchemy too much to do ORAM operations uh, because it's not the use case. Of Redshift, um, I mean, you can still uh, create queries using SQL Alchemy, but like we don't really use models um, in that way. Um, and the other benefit of having SQL Alchemy is that you can it, it just nicely integrates uh, with um, a migration framework called Alembic, um, which is um, quite complex and, and quite kind of featureful. Um, 
but essentially, like with a migration framework, it's really a true operation that you, that, that you tend to use. Uh, one is uh, alembic revision, which generates a migration files. And, um, and once you have these migration files, you can uh, run this migration file on the current schema to upgrade the schema or downgrade the schema, depending what, what kind of direction you want to go. And uh, to apply these files, it's, it's just a matter of running like an ambic upgrade. Um, um, as I said, it's quite, it's quite a complex uh, framework. Uh, it supports multiple environments. Uh, Auto-generation only works sometime uh, because Redshift is definitely, as a lot of edge cases, is a, is a bit weird sometimes. Uh, especially, for example, when you alter columns, like um, you cannot really alter columns in Redshift. You have to drop columns and re-add them, um, which has a lot of consequences. Uh, which gets me into these annoyances. Um, Redshift has, has a lot of things which are quite annoying. For example, like the virtual length is expressed in bytes instead of characters, um, while for Postgres is, is expressed in characters. Uh, so sometimes you have edge cases where, like you, you know, kind of scrape uh, sites with Japanese characters, and then suddenly, like. Uh, the loading breaks because you know kind of the Japanese characters are mostly uh, using the Unicode extension, so you have you probably have two bytes instead of one byte, and that was really annoying uh, for us. You can add column types, as I said before. Um, uh, referential integrity is not really a thing in, in Redshift, so primary keys and foreign keys are not really enforced. Um, but that's okay because we don't, we don't, for our use case, we don't need it. Uh, columns are nullable by default, which I think is different in Postgres. Um, is this system future proof? Um, yeah, we, we're reasonably happy with it. Um, Rashi's pattern came out, which seems very interesting because it would uh, essentially mean that we would, uh, we could potentially skip all the loading in Redshift uh, because Spectrum reads data directly from S3. Um, there's uh, like a couple of open source projects which we might look at. Uh, one is called PressDB, um, which again is is able to run queries directly on S3 um, without you having to kind of ingest these files in a database. Um, seems, which is quite nice. And um, uh, we don't stream to S3, which might be like a good uh, thing to look at. Um, and there's another project which I want to mention. Uh, it's actually an extension to PostgreSQL called Citus. And uh, it's done uh, kind of by uh, like a, a company in, uh, in, in US. And uh, like if you are a fan of PostgreSQL and you want to kind of use raw, like the original PostgreSQL with all the extension that, that you kind of learn to like, um, you can use, uh, you can look at uh, this company, um, Citus Data is called. Um, uh, yeah, uh, thanks a lot. I think that was that was it. Um, I actually want to mention, like, I'm actually looking for work, especially on kind of this sort of stuff, because I really enjoyed it. So if you have, um, you know, if you have uh, like a project like that, you know, kind of um, talk about it. I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. And um, yeah, I mean, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much for for listening. Now, so any question to Federico? And yeah, thanks for your talk. All right, thank you.